buenos días uh, en México y buenas, ta eh, perdón, buenas tardes en México. Buenos días aquí en Tucson. Es uh, un placer muy grande eh, recibirlos el día de hoy. I'm going to switch to English. Uh, good, uh, good morning uh, here in Tucson. Good afternoon in, uh, in Mexico City and the rest of Mexico. It's my pleasure to be uh, today here uh, in this event that uh, we are co-organizing uh, Uh, under the leadership of the Consulate of Mexico in Tucson and also UNAM Tucson, who are our um, uh, partner institutions with the University of Arizona College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And it's my pleasure uh, today to present uh, Professor William Beasley, who is a renowned historian around the world. And he has been one of the pioneers uh, of the uh, cultural history applied to Mexico. Uh, I'm going to be presenting him uh, today, but before doing that, I really want to, uh, to uh, extend our appreciation and our thanks uh, uh, to the institutions that are backing up and that are represented today by uh, their heads. First, I want to thank uh, the Consulate of Mexico in Tucson, and on behalf of, of this institution, we have uh, the honor of having today uh, Consul Rafael. Rafael Barceló Durazo, uh, who has been really excited about having this um, series of events focused on uh, the independence of Mexico, the history and the culture of, uh, of Mexico throughout uh, our outlets. Uh, thank you, Consul Barceló, for being here. And also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Elena Centeno, who is the director of UNAM Tucson, And uh, she has been also very supportive and very enthusiastic in promoting the culture and history of Mexico. Uh, so we have a very solid collaboration with, uh, with her and with her institution. Uh, UNAM is the largest university of, um, of Mexico and one of the largest and more important universities in Latin America and the world. So we are very honored to share a very strong partnership with them Uh, Elena, thanks for, for representing UNAM here in this event. And also I want to welcome Professor William Beasley, as I was uh, saying, he is a professor uh, at the history department uh, in the University of Arizona. And he has been a leading scholar on the study of history of Mexico, uh, 19th and 20th century cultural history. And he has focused on his career and, and different issues of, of, the, uh, of the everyday life for people. So he, he has studied the culture of celebrations, the culture of, uh, uh, of the different uh, dimensions that uh, cover uh, everyday life uh, from puppets to, uh, to uh, as I said, patriotic celebrations, but also all their other parties that are uh, all around our place in, in Mexico. So thank you, Professor Beasley, for, for being here. It's our honor to, uh, to be here with you. I want to give the word to uh, Consul Rafael Barceló, who wants to express a special welcome message to our audiences who are joining us today. I think you're muted. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, thank you so much for all the audience that is participating with us today. Uh, we are very happy and thrilled to have this conversation with Professor Beasley. And when we thought about this idea of the historical significance of the national celebrations, we were planning on, on focusing the light on the next evolution of our civic celebrations. Tomorrow, we were going to celebrate El Grito, the, the ceremony that is the most important for us uh, through, through the social media. And it's going to be live, but it's, uh, this has been a celebration of a great significance, particularly for Mexicans living abroad. And this time we, we are in the middle of a, of a pandemic that has costed the lives of uh, thousands of people in the United States and thousands of people in Mexico in the world. And uh, we didn't want, of course, to, to, to just cancel any celebration. We just transformed 
the way that we are going to celebrate this time. And I think that is particularly important for a region like Tucson, where when the independence happened, it was part of Mexico, it was part of that project. So um, let me also thank, of course, uh, UNAM for being here, the UNAM Tucson, uh, Dr. Elena Centeno, thank you so much for joining us in this project. We are having our cultural program um, and with the participation of, of UNAM and because we are, we are all in, very proud in Mexico of all the cultural and scientific and academic production of our uh, highest uh, house of studies in, in, in Mexico. I want to thank, of course, Luis, who, Luis Coronel, Dr. Luis Coronado, who is with us, um, and we are working together and collaborating in, in, in several projects, uh, particularly with the University of Arizona, but also with another uh, civil society initiatives that uh, Luis is participating with. And of course, uh, Professor William Beasley, we are very pleased to have one of the uh, most um, recognized expert uh, on Mexico, a recipient of the Premio Otley, the Otley Prize that the government of Mexico uh, grants to recognize the, 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 the work uh, in favor of the Mexican communities abroad. And uh, talking to us of these, the historical significances of our celebrations. So tomorrow at 7 p.m., we will have this concert of independence followed by the El Grito, uh, the Independencia, or El Grito de Dolores. And we wanted to make all these reflections and anticipation of the historical significance on it. I, I only have um, uh, words of gratitude for all of you that are participating with us, for the people who are listening to this, uh, to this conference. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you, Consul, for, for your nice words. And, and really, we are really uh, uh, appreciative of, of all the support and efforts that the Mexican government is uh, doing through uh, the representation of, of, the Mexi uh, of, uh, of Mexico here in Tucson. We have an, a strong collaboration already and, and really appreciate uh, this channel to communicate with our communities, bo uh, both sides of the border. Thank you so much. Uh, so before starting, I just want to give you uh, some um, uh, uh, specific uh, points of Professor Beasley's career. He's a cultural historian and he's a specialist on Latin America and Mexico. Uh, he has been the director of the Oaxaca Graduate Field School in Modern Mexican History for many years and has been a distinguished visiting professor at El Colegio de Mexico and UNAM uh, in different periods. He's, so, he's also author of dozens of books, including the classic Judas at the Jockey Club and other episodes of Porfirian Mexico. And he has been also editor of numerous books and other uh, outlets like the Oxford History of Mexico. So we are very, very honored of having Professor Beasley who has been also uh, by the Mexican government as recipient Mexican government gives to, uh, uh, to foreigners. So he's an Otley recipient too. Thank you so much, Professor Beasley. And he's gonna present his work. And after that, I, I, I invite you to remain there because uh, also Professor Elena Centeno is gonna give us some uh, brief remarks, closing remarks. And after that, we're gonna have a Q&A uh, section so I invite you to remain there and, and just share your thoughts and your questions in our Facebook Live uh, feed. And we are gonna uh, uh, read that question to Professor Beasley and he's gonna uh, answer those at the end. So thank you so much. Without more preamble, here's the uh, first presentation of Professor Beasley. And after that, we're gonna interview him. Uh, go ahead, Professor Beasley, thank you so much. You're welcome so much. I'm honored to be here. It's always an incredible delight for me to have a chance to meet friends from Mexico and to discuss aspects of Mexican cultural history. So I'm deeply honored. I wanna say happy 212th 
anniversary of Mexican independence for the Republic. 212 years of independence as a Republic is remarkable. Also, let me begin by acknowledging those individuals who made this gathering possible on Zoom and on Facebook. Most notably, I want to thank the Council for Mexico and Tucson, the Honorable Rafael Barcelo Durazo, whom I've just met, and I'm delighted to meet him, and his staff, especially Ernesto Del Rio, the regional, regional IT expert who is connecting all of us and making this all possible. That's very great. La doctora Elena Centeno Garcelena. Wow. She always looks so happy sitting in front of her library. Who would guess that she's actually a very serious geologist, but not just a person who reads, but wow. It's always nice to see you again. And then finally, Luis Coronado Grell, Director of SBS Mexican Initiatives. And this College of Social Science Initiative program is doing incredible things, reaching out in Tucson to UNAM Tucson, to the Consulate of Mexico in Tucson, to the colleges in the borderlands, and of course to his home state of San Luis Potosí and then Mexico. So congratulations for doing all of that, Luis, and thank you everyone for making it possible for me to be here. On September 27th, 1821, Augustin de Iturbide and his troops came into Mexico City and proclaimed Mexican independence from Spain. For the new nation, the leaders immediately had to determine, besides what form of government they wanted, how they were gonna celebrate national holidays and what heroes they were going to celebrate as the legacy of their struggle to become a republic and what part of their heritage they were going to honor. They debated this and the date and the heroes were conflicted over a period of time. Some believed that Ether Bide should be honored and that the 27th should be the day of independence. A larger ma majority favored September 1516 and Padre Miguel Hidalgo as the man and the date that represented the, initi the initiation of the struggle for Mexican independence. They would eventually be successful. Next slide. Are you all seeing a slide? Ah, oh, good, okay. And is this a slide of Padre Hidalgo? I'm not seeing them, so I hope you're seeing Padre Hidalgo. Okay. Um, the assembly decided to se celebrate September 15, 16, 1810, and Padre Miguel Hidalgo, who shouted for the first time that Mexicans should seize their independence. During the next 30 years, that would be debated, but nevertheless, Hidalgo's grito for independence in Dolores, Guanajuato, a small town hosting a small fiesta would be the birthplace, the cradle of Mexican independence. That was celebrated usually at 11 o'clock on September 15th, but no one knows exactly when that took place and no one knows exactly what he said. What we do know is that Padre Hidalgo rang the parish bell as an alarm. And so everyone gathered at the parish church to hear what he had to say. Something that he said was like this. He called on the parishioners to achieve freedom, political freedom, to regain their properties, their lands, 
and to bring an end to Spanish rule. In one version of the Grito, he asked, will you be slaves of Napoleon or will you as patriots defend your religion, your hearths and your rights? He continued, it is said, long live religion, long live our most holy mother of Guadalupe, long live America, death to bad government and Beth death to the Gauchapines. That is to the Spaniards who rode their horses with spurs that they would use to kick their horses or anyone else. Now, we don't know if this is actually what he said. No one was there to take a recording of it or to make notes on what he said. And tomorrow night, we do know that the president will say something similar, but it will end with Viva Mexico, Viva la Independencia. And that is pretty much what we've come to agree on was said that night. Some of you may say, how, how strange. Why did Hidalgo mention France? It's because the French under Napoleon had invaded Spain, had taken over much of the country and had named Napoleon's brother, the King of Spain. And so they were actually ruling Spain and there was fear that the French would come and take over Mexico. There wasn't much chance of that ha happening actually because Napoleon's brother, he was called Pepe, Napoleon's brother Pepe spent most of his time sitting on the throne of Spain in Madrid, drinking wine and doing other things to enjoy rather than worrying about Mexico. But still Hidalgo knew the situation and brought this question up. The people in Dolores agreed with Hidalgo and followed him and they marched from Dolores going south to the first place where they hoped to make, uh, to seize power. And in the process, as they were going past, they went by a convent and Hidalgo stopped them and they went in and Hidalgo got a banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And on that banner, they wrote Viva la Independencia and the Virgin of Guadalupe became the symbol of the struggle for independence the symbol of Mexican culture going forward. This is especially interesting because Hidalgo and his army successfully defeated Spaniards, moved south and got to the edge of Mexico City. And the people in Mexico City, the Spaniards there, got their virgin, the Virgin of Remedios, and created the version of Remedios around the city to protect them from Hidalgo and Guadalupe. So this became a clash between two virgins, one with a connection to Spain and one with a connection to Mexico City. And this is significant because it shows that Hidalgo and the patriots who were fighting for independence recognized a cultural connection between the Virgin of Guadalupe and in daily life, not faith so much, but in daily life and in their activities, while the Spaniards continued to recognize the Virgin of Los Remedios as the person who guarded their daily life. So what happened after 1821 is the decision was to celebrate Hidalgo, to celebrate 1810, and to celebrate the version of Guadalupe, rather than Augustine Iturbide, rather than September 27th. And as it turned out, this also 
resulted in political connections. That is, those who favored Guadalupe tended to be liberals. Those who supported either be they tended to be conservatives. And this was an on and off again struggle that continued for the next 30 years. Nevertheless, celebrations were held every year for, for the Grito de Dolores. They were celebrated September 15th at night and then the next day there would be a major celebration. And the major celebration would usually involve parades, multi-ethnic parades of different groups, uh, of different occupations, of different individuals who would march through the community, if it was Mexico, Mexico City, or whatever town they were in. And these parades and celebrations were organized by patriotic committees who would raise the money to have the celebration. And as any good Mexican celebration, it included three things that were absolutely necessary in any good Mexican fiesta. First, fireworks. There had to be tremendous number of fireworks purchased that would be exploded. Secondly, there had to be music. And this music had to be provided in some form that would make everybody enjoy it and would associate it with this pattern. And third, there had to be food and drink for the community to celebrate. And I'll talk more about that later if you want me to about food and drink associated with the Grito and what you should eat tomorrow night or the night of the 16th or what you should drink. Um, this annual celebration took place in communities all across Mexico. It was not a Mexico City celebration. This was a community celebration. This, so any, it's an important thing to recognize that the pattern was different depending on the community and what they believed was important about it that they should celebrate. Well, um, as I said, this continued for 30 years of struggle on and off. And the end of the idea that somehow Augustine to be there should be recognized ended about 30 years later. And it really ended during the time of the next great national hit hero, Benito Juarez. So the next slide. And Benito Juarez, while he was president for various, at various times, um, changed the nature of the celebration so that it was focused with, on political liberalism, but more important, focused on economic modernization. Benito Juarez wanted to demonstrate that Mexico had the capability, the capacity to become a major economic force in the Americas equal to the United States, equal to Argentina, equal to other places. And the measure of that for most people in that time in the 19th century was railroads. And Benito Juarez supported the idea of having railroads built in Mexico. That was quite successful. And then most dramatically in 1860, 1867, Mexico completed the railroad between Mexico City and Puebla. And so for the Grito de Dolores, the celebration of the Grito de Dolores, Hidalgo, his cabinet, the members of the Senate and the assembly took the train from Mexico City and went to Puebla. And so Mexicans, Mexicans along the way could see 
this whole successful program going forward on the train. And then when they arrived in Mexico City, I mean, in Puebla, when they got there, what, fireworks, music, there was an opera performed about the locomotive, they had dinner, they had tequila, all of these kind of things, and then came back, took the train back and celebrated again in Mexico City. And of course, Juarez made, gave the grito so that the people in Mexico City knew that it took place. He gave credit in, in his discussions during independence celebrations at that time to the importance of the new constitution of 1857, the constitution that separated church and state, the, the constitution that made economic change possible for Mexicans to move forward in his estimation. Here, I have to say this is just completely on an aside. Benito Juarez, one of the things he believed that would make a huge difference in Mexico from his exile in New Orleans, brought back to Mexico the Singer sewing machine. And that was widely distributed. They began bringing them in. And if you go to antique stores in Mexico today, you will find Singer sewing machines all over the place because this, this was what he saw as the huge change in Mexican life to have the sewing machine with independence. Oddly, this is exactly the kind of thing that happened in India where the sewing machine and independence were combined to make life different there. So it's an interesting idea about development that I believe um, the Indians took from Benito Juarez, the experience of Mexico and applied it there. We don't know whether that's true or not, but I think that it is. Besides this exam on 1867, that was followed by another major example in 1883, when Mexico's railroad lines had reached to over 1200 miles and the holiday was promoted for the first time. That is the Grito was promoted for the first time as a tourist opportunity. So there was publicity in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Cuba, places like that, come to Mexico to see the celebration, see the Grito, ride the train from Veracruz to Mexico City in comfort, enjoy yourself. And so that took place in 1883. And because they had done that, the Mexico City government, not the national government, but the Mexico City government had a patriotic community, a patriotic committee that organized a parade with 18, 18 floats or carros, carros allegoricos. And those were spectacular because what they did is tell the story of Mexico in 18 floats and it became like a textbook going down the street and people could see the history of their country. If they couldn't read or they couldn't read well or they didn't go to school, they learned the history of their country in these parades that were taking place. The first one of these was Christopher Columbus. And so it was like in 1883, the presentation was Mexico's history began when the Europeans got there. It was like no history took place before that. And then it followed up with a series of allegorical floats that somehow showed progress, peace, industry, railroads, textiles, food production, all of these things that took place along with the Virgin of Guadalupe, which not in a religious sense, 
but the Virgin of Guadalupe represented daily culture. And this was all brought together in these 1883 floats that were quite dramatic to see. The other floats that I think are really interesting was there was a float put together by the National Prep School. Now, National Prep School number one, and because there are several, but National Prep School number one. And these demonstrated the importance of scientific thinking for Mexico. That was what the float was gonna show. Bam, science, we have to have science. We have to have positivism. We can't rely on social sciences. Sorry, Louise, but behavioral and social sciences, not, we're not going to do the job. Um, all of Mexico's national heroes were represented on these floats, beginning with Hidalgo. But of course, Ether Bide was not there. Benito, Benito Juarez was. Well, the nature of the Grito changed with the arrival of Porfirio Diaz. And one of the things that Porfirio Diaz decided, and this is interesting, Porfirio Diaz decided that the bell that Padre Hidalgo rang was still at the parish church in Hidalgo. And Diaz wanted that bell brought to Mexico City, put on display, and then it would be taken out of the museum, out of where it was, to the national executive offices, and he could ring it before he gave the grito on September 15th. 1896, that finally happened. Now, if you like mysteries, there is, there is a story that it's not really the bell, that the bell was stolen. And indeed the bell was stolen, but then it was, they captured the guy who supposedly stole it and the government has it. Do they have the real one? Mm, who knows, you know? So this is a good opportunity if you like to write fiction and rather than history, you can write about this missing bell. But from 1896 on, the president of Mexico rings the bell on the night of September 15th and gives the grito. It can, that practice continues until today. Um, well, next slide. 1910, Mexico found itself in a deeply complicated situation. Presidential election of Porfirio Diaz, who was quite old, had just, just succeeded. There was growing insurgency taking place as revolutionaries began to appear. But nevertheless, 1910, the centennial of Mexican independence. And this was a huge celebration with uh, the Mexican government inviting everyone representing governments in Western Europe and the Americas to visit. All kinds of tourists came to Mexico to see the celebration and it was really quite spectacular. Consequently, the centennial celebration included a parade that was going to show the history of Mexico. And this time, it's very interesting that the Porfirians chose to have an, in the parade a group of individuals represent the Aztec culture, demonstrate the Aztec culture in the parade. What's strange about this is they were not indigenous people in the parade. They were mestizos who were hired to be in the parade by the Mexican government. They, they could have had Indios, but they chose to have mestizos dress up as Aztecs in the parade. Then they had colonial officials. Then they had 
representatives of the national government. And finally, of course, they had Porfirio special groups, including the rurales. So this was a special presentation. And I think the next slide shows you a group of these indigenous reputed Aztec indigenous people. And we'll go to the next slide. Even more important during the centennial celebration was the night of the Grito. When that took place at the night of the Grito, the city around the National Palace was lighted up by electric lights. And this was a demonstration that Mexico had taken a major step toward modernization with electricity. In the non, well, it was sort of like railroads, electricity, factories. That was the progress of modernization. And Mexico was well on the way to do that. Despite the electrification that took place in Mexico City in 1910. As you see in that slide, or you should be able to see in that slide, eight months later, Porfirio Diaz and his closest associates left for France and the Mexican Revolution took place. As kind of coming full circle, in 1921, the Mexican government of Alvaro Obregón celebrated the centennial of Iter Bide's success in 1811, uh, in the 1821. So we have 1821, 1921 celebration with Obregón. And this was a spectacular celebration as well. And because it was a revolutionary government, Many people came to see it. Hidalgo was honored. Iturbide was honored. The Niños Héroes, because of their efforts against the invading United States during that war, um, were also honored during this period. The holiday had many dramatic and musical events, and the government gave free admission to the working class. What's also distinctive about uh, 1921 is for the first time there was a real effort to have prominent women dress as China Poblanas. This became the symbol of Mexican national womanhood with the China Poblana or Tawana costume. And for the first time, the same thing for men as well as men began wearing the Charo costume. And this was recognized as part of the independence celebration. This is something that tells you about Mexico's population at the time. Mexican officials felt the country was underpopulated. And so also as part of the independence celebration, the Mexican government gave every woman who had a child in September a Mexican national flag to honor them for having children to support the nation. So, uh, there I am, I disappeared. Uh, so we have new national stereotypes um, of the Charo, the Chino Poblana, and efforts to promote the growth of the population. Next slide. We only have two more slides. We do these very quickly. This slide shows you that tomorrow night, uh, um, oh, that the bicentennial this is the bicentennial with lights again. And 
the bicentennial was a major celebration for Mexico because it was a time when the Pan regime was doing well. There was a feeling that Mexico had become a practicing democratic political system. There was great pleasure in that. And um, 200 years of independence. Next slide. That sh slide shows last year, but it will be tomorrow night when Mexico's current president will step on, out on the balcony of the presidential palace, ring the bell from the town of Dolores Hidalgo and give the grito. So I have to say, these are difficult times, but I'm an optimist and I believe that Mexico is leading the way in many cases with dealing with economic and social issues. And they're doing it with a strong sense of their cultural successes and their history of leadership like Padre Miguel Hidalgo. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Beasley. We are we are very pleased with your with your presentation, and and certainly uh, you brought so many uh, different aspects of this complex history, which is uh, as you know really long, and there are so many details that have contributed to the formation of this ceremonial you have been talking about, and so. But we we are very interested in in. Uh, in finding out about some of the uh, deeper everyday life meanings of the celebration. So uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, one of the, the first ones is, uh, could you elaborate a little bit more uh, on the participation of women in the, uh, in the process of the independence war and all the organization? Yeah, for sure. Josefa Ortiz de Dominguez is the most prominent woman from the independence period. And she actually made it possible for Hidalgo and that group to launch the revolution because she found out that the Viceroy was sending the military up to Dolores to arrest them all. And so she's very important and she appears on Mexican stamps, Mexican coins. And so she's recognized, but she was the leader of a whole group of women in Mexico City who were very active in collecting information and serving as an intelligence service for the Patriots. And so they played a very prominent role. And uh, another question I, I, I think it's important to raise at this point is uh, what would be uh, some of the personal and family aspects of the Independence Day celebrations from your point of view? Well, first of all, I think that families, family groups are gonna get together and have a traditional Grito dinner or dinner independence dinner and that means they sh will probably be having chiles en nogada. Chiles en nogada are chili rellenos that is stuffed green chilies and they're so the green like the flag right behind you is from the chile. The nogada is a walnut. This is like a walnut sauce that is made and that's the white of the flag. And then the red comes from the pomegranate seeds that are put on. So you have the colors of the nation represented in that food and it's, oh, it's great. It's difficult, it takes, it's con time consuming to do it, but families will do it for the Grito de Independence. 
Yeah, those those are delicious. And actually, uh, there there's a whole story behind the uh, the chiles and nogada creation, uh, linked to the cro uh, the crowning of the, of uh, Agustin de Iturbide, uh, that you know ties to the conventional inventions. I mean, those are rumors, and and you are an expert on rumors. So what? What you can say about those <laughs> <laughs> rumors in history? Yes, and we are fan of those too. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, well, I mean, and then the other important thing, I, I don't want to intrude because I'm too much because I know Elena is going needs to speak too. Um, but the other thing that many people will be having tomorrow night and the next day is called the drink called the bandera bandera that is the flag and the bandera is so you have tequila right which is clear it's white like the flag lime another so you have one glass of tequila one glass of lime which is the green and then the third glass is sangrita. And sangrita is a kind of spicy tomato juice made with orange and orange juice or lime juice and um, something spicy, jalapeno, <laughs> something like that. And so, so then you drink those three. You have, you know, it's a little sip. Please, if you're listen to this on Facebook or something. Ignore this if you are not 21. This is <laughs> this is a pro 21 aspect to the celebration, right? Yes. Louise? Thank you so much, Professor. And, and as you said, I uh, we we want first before before listening to Elena, I want to to thank you. We we after Elena's intervention we can retake our, our questions. But uh, definitely has been a great lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And uh, I, I would be delighted to uh, listen to our co-host, Dr. Elena Centeno, who is the director of UNAM uh, Tucson, who also wants to do some remarks about uh, this, uh, this online event. Thank you so much, Elena. Thank you very much, uh, Luis, for the introduction. Well, you know, it's so, so interesting and so exciting to have Dr. Disley talking about history because he has this way of describing it to, that makes it, you know, we can taste the chiles and nogada when he talks about them. Well, I just want to thank everybody for, um, uh, for organizing this event. I want to thank Dr. Disley for participating in this event and uh, Luis, Thank you, Luis Coronado, for, um, for also willing to organize this event. Um, uh, the University of uh, Arizona and uh, UNAM have a very strong collaboration. Actually, uh, we have a consortium for human rights and uh, migration that is very active. And the idea is to provide with um, joint research uh, regarding the difficulties that the borders have in general, and particularly the border within, between Mexico and the US. So uh, Luis is uh, the representative of this consortium and uh, we've been doing a great um, collaboration with the whole uh, College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Luis. And thank you, this is one more event that shows all this uh, strong collaboration we have together. I want to thank uh, the, uh, the Consul Rafael Barceló and also Consul Enrique Gomez uh, for uh, having this uh, opportunity to interact with the universities. Uh, UNAM Tucson has been present in the state of Arizona for uh, five years already, uh, almost six years. We are very happy to be placed at the, at the campus at the University of Arizona. And uh, the idea of UNAM Tucson is to help the community to bring uh, culture and education to the Spanish speaking community in here in Tucson, but also in, in general in Arizona. 
and to promote the collaboration and, uh, and the activities together between the, the University of Mexico, UNAM, and the universities local in Arizona. I also want to thank Ernesto Casarrubias, uh, who is in charge of the technologies at the consulate. Thank you, Ernesto, and Arnoldo Bautista, who is uh, the vice director of the office of UNAM Tucson. And um, going back to history, I would love to hear a little more about your opinion. There is this uh, chapter at the Manuel uh, Pino's book, The Bandidos de Rio Frio. He has a chapter that he describes with a lot of detail the celebrations of independence by Porfirio Diaz and how uh, Porfirio was going to have a, um, they had actually a mass at the Guadalupe Virgin uh, uh, Chapel in Mexico City, the Chapel of uh, Guadalupe Virgin. And then later on, he describes with a lot of detail all the food and the people who were invited and so on. Um, could you please just elaborate a little more on um, how much is the impact of, of this celebration as a celebration have moved away from really the independence and more to be just a party or a way to uh, show uh, to show the, uh, to the people of Mexico this um, identity, you know? Uh, it's amazing to see how with years it's been just evolving in a different ways. And um, I don't know if today we really have an idea of uh, what it really means, you know? Well, I think that you're absolutely right. There's a, the celebration today is different than it was earlier. Part of this has led to confusion, especially in the United States and the Southwest, of what is independence? Is it in September or is Cinco de Mayo? And so because of the Cinco de Mayo question, people are not sure what they're celebrating. Um, but also, I think it's because Mexican society uh, has become more I don't want to say they're less nationalistic, but in a, some kind of a sense, they're less nationalistic, so independence is not as important. Um, the question of independence is not is important, framed as a holiday. We see the same thing in the United States. Fourth of July is not, for us, is not as important as it was. It's more about having hot dogs and beer and going swimming and things like that. I hope that helps and I hope that's... Thank you. Thank yes. you, Dr. Beasley. And uh, again, I wanna thank uh, the Consul Rafael Barcelo. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us to, to your celebrations. And UNAM Tucson is here to help you and collaborate in any of the initiatives that you have regarding the uh, promotion of culture and education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena, for, for your comments. And, and thank you, uh, Professor Beasley. Uh, we have some other, uh, some other questions, uh, but before uh, closing this, this event, I really uh, want to uh, re-express our gratitude to the institutions who have been uh, backing up uh, this event, uh, the Consulate of Mexico in Tucson, who has integrated this event to the set of activities they have organized to uh, celebrate uh, Mexico's independence this week and, and the, whole, the whole month. But we have other, other uh, collaborations in, in, the, in the oven now and that we have been uh, disclosing soon uh, to the public. And, and also, uh, Thanks to Unam Tucson, who has been uh, our prime uh, partner and a li uh, liaison to, to the Unam uh, different departments and different schools on social sciences. We really appreciate uh, the work of uh, Dr. Elena Centeno for linking us with the right context, uh, contacts down there. And 
as, as she mentioned, we have a uh, very important uh, collaboration going on on different aspects of, uh, of society and the binational agenda with Mexico. Mostly uh, the consortium of uh, human rights, human security and migration, but also other areas, uh, as you can see, history and, and anthropology, uh, Latin American studies, Mexican American studies. So stay, stay tuned on, on those collaborations. And as Elena mentioned, uh, we are very, very um, thankful with all the, per, all the people who have been involved in the organization in the, uh, of this uh, online event. Uh, the uh, uh, director of IT in, uh, in, in the consulate, Ernesto del Rio Casarubias, and also Dr. Arnoldo Bautista, who has been always uh, uh, working on uh, all the details that are around these events uh, to be successful. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I will see if there are some questions from the public uh, because we are really engaged with this topic. And I think we are getting in, in the mood for that tequila that Professor Bisley mentioned. So uh, one, uh, another, another important uh, thing I think I think is important to mention or to, to ask Professor Beasley is if there are some specific holiday clothing clothing for either men or women in 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 Mexican celebrations. What what is your experience, uh, Professor Beasley, on this uh, on this area? Well, I, as I said, I think that Chino, the costume of the Chino Poblana or the Tijuana is becoming very important or has become very important for women to wear. And even presidential first ladies were wearing um, those costumes during the 20s and 30s. The Charo costume, you know, maybe, but I think that uh, not so much for, for men. I think it's more um, of a female costume. Um, Hats, of course, wearing a big sombrero is always good to wear during a celebration, but you're probably going to lose it in the parade. Mm -hmm. Someone will take it or you'll, it'll fall off. So those are the, those are the only ones I, I know. Great. And is, is there any anecdote you would like to share with us uh, when you have been uh, in Mexico, uh, having opportunity to celebrate? With, uh, with your friends down there, with your students, something that you, that we <laughs> this, this day? Well, you know, Luis, at the Zocalo tomorrow night, one of the things that, that especially youngsters like to do, teenagers, early 20s, are to throw eggs that are eggshells that are full of flour and they will throw them or you get hit with them so suddenly you get covered with flour and so you know they don't hurt but it's just kind of part of the celebration of this kind of throwing things having fun and that's that's what I remember most about going to the Zocalo to see Independence Day and then going to have a tequila afterwards that's wonderful. Yes, uh, well, uh, I, I, I just uh, want to uh, thank you, Professor Beasley, for your presence here, for sharing all this uh, information about our celebration uh, uh, with Mexico. And, and also, uh, one, one personal question I have for you is, uh, well, it's not personal, but it's, it's, it's on my own. Uh, okay. It, what, what can you tell us about uh, the celebration of the September parties here in the US? Because there's, there's a confusion uh, in the public that they believe that Cinco de Mayo is, uh, is the Mexican independence, right? So yes. maybe, uh, coming from you, a comment would be, would be very nice for the public to understand the difference between the two celebrations. So what you can say about that? This is one of those things that I believe is a result of beer companies <laughs> because the beer companies, Anheuser-Busch, Bud, began sponsoring Cinco de, Mar 
Cinco de Mayo parties and giving reduced prices on beer in Mexican American communities. And so they, they pressed the idea that this is Mexican independence and it, it was to sell beer. And then another beer company supported September 15, 16. I think the best thing for you to do, if you're trying to figure out in the US how to celebrate, go to a local Mexican restaurant. They know, and they will have the food that you want. They will have tequila, they will have beer, and they will have chiles en nogada. So that's what I would say. Thank you so much, Professor. Well, I think uh, we, we, we will close this event and, and we really uh, are, are thankful with you for, for sharing uh, this conversation with, with our audiences. And certainly, uh, again, we are very thankful for, for uh, the back of, of the institutions we partnered with uh, in Mexico, uh, the Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores, through the Council of Mexico in Tucson, and also the UNAM Tucson, who is the representative of the National University of Mexico. Thank you, uh, all of you, and thank you, all the audience who is uh, connected there in Facebook Live. Uh, you can consult this, uh, this conference again uh, by clicking on the, uh, on the website of Facebook Live of the Consulate of Mexico in Tucson and uh, also the Consul Rafael Barceló. Thank you for hosting us. He, he uh, sent uh, an invitation for everyone. Tomorrow, uh, the Consulate is gonna have the Concert of Independence and El Grito from 7 p.m. They have organized uh, a, a full uh, set of events around the theme of the, of the independence with Mexico. So please stay tuned and follow them, follow UNAM Tucson and follow SBS Mexico initiatives. We are uh, pleased having you and stay tuned. There, are, there is more to come. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Professor Beasley. And thank you, everyone.